Hey, I'm Micah. I'm a member here at Faith. Today, the passage is 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, welcome to our Good Friday sermon coming straight to you from my living room. Uh, we are uh, quarantined here due to uh, circumstances out of our control. Uh, so I appreciate your uh, patience with us. Uh, this is the first sermon I've ever given from my living room. So it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, and uh, uh, but my guess is this is also the first Good Friday service you have watched from your living room. So uh, so that is also awkward. And so I think we're both in the same uh, in the same boat here. And so, I uh, appreciate you uh, joining us um, this uh, uh, this evening. I recently read a book called The Volunteer. Uh, it was a great recommendation from uh, Alice Vernon, and it is uh, it's the story of Witold uh, Pilecki, and uh, and this is how the introduction starts. Uh, Witold Pilecki volunteered to be imprisoned in Auschwitz. It's an incredible story of a Polish resistance fighter who voluntarily uh, got arrested by the Nazi soldiers rounding up Jews so that he could work for the resistance from inside. Uh, he willingly submitted himself to the suffering of the most infamous concentration camp of the war uh, because he loved his country and was willing to do whatever it took uh, to save it. Uh, I have a cousin, Sarah, who lives in California, and uh, this week she got on an airplane with two or three uh, thousand other medical workers uh, to fly to New York uh, to help with, uh, uh, with the emergencies uh, with, the, uh, with the virus in New York City. Uh, she left where she was uh, to head into the middle of uh, of the of the storm, and uh, and we've seen countless stories uh, of that recently of people uh, of people leaving uh, sort of the safety and comfort of where they are uh, to go into where there's trouble and uh, and take risk on themselves for the sake of. Uh, helping the people who are there. Uh, we have, I mean, we have doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, uh, even in our own uh, community, right? Even from our own church uh, and even uh, from our own families, uh, that are doing this every day, risking uh, their own health, uh, their own safety, to go into our hospitals, uh, into our uh, doctors' offices, to be able to care for people who are uh, who are sick. Uh, there, there's something about these stories uh, that are, that's. Uh, that, that's so compelling for us because, because we know that this is a glimpse of what it really looks like to love people, uh, to risk, to take something on yourself, uh, to be willing uh, to rescue somebody else who's in trouble. Now, as we talk this evening, uh, part of what we're going to see is that God's love is a rescuing love. It's a love that enters into the mess and brokenness of this world to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. God's love is Jesus taking that brokenness and sinfulness, our sinfulness, on himself so he could purchase forgiveness of sins and redemption of this world with his life. Jesus didn't enter into the world with just a chance of getting the sickness of sin. He came knowing what he had to do and knowing what it would cost him to do it. And this is why the love of God is most visible through Jesus, who gives his life so that we might live through him. And this is what we're going to talk about from the book of 1 John. Uh, you should be able to follow along with us in the order of worship that you got in an email uh, or in your Bible. Uh, I'll say if you don't have either of those, uh, first of all, uh, please let us know uh, through our website. We'd love to uh, send you a Bible. Uh, we give away a, a lot of Bibles, uh, even in lots of different languages. Uh, and every time we do, it's it's a privilege uh, to get to do it. So please let us know, and we'd love to uh, we'd love to send you one. Uh, but if you don't have any of those things right now, you can type First John uh, four nine through eleven 
ESV into Google, and you'll be able to follow along with exactly what we're looking at uh, also. So here we go. First John uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. We uh, we're, uh, look at verse 9 again here. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God's love is in the person of Jesus. I think this is the first thing we see from, uh, from our passage. God's love is in the person of Jesus. Look at what it says in verse 9. The love of God was made manifest among us. John is talking about the, the person of Jesus Christ here. Jesus was made manifest, made real among us. In one of John's other writings, he says, God put on flesh and dwelt among us. And that flesh and bone person is Jesus. God could have sent anything to rescue us, but he sent a person. And I think we understand the value of unmediated flesh and blood uh, people uh, more than ever right now. I know I do. <laughs> I've seen more of myself on a screen uh, in the last month than I had ever hoped to in a lifetime. Uh, but I've also seen other people through a screen more than ever. And we're probably all feeling this loss of in-person, face-to-face conversations. We miss being close to people, uh, hugging people. <laughs> well, I have some friends who probably don't miss the no-hugging thing at all. But, uh, uh, but you know what I mean. We feel right now that there's something important, uh, something unique, something we need in the physical flesh and blood presence of someone else. God knows this. Because he's the one who made us this way. So he sends us a person as our savior. And how does John know that Jesus is this savior? John saw him, touched him, heard him, witnessed incredible things that he did. So when John says he was made manifest among us, he means God's son lived with John. John knew Jesus. He saw everything he needed to see to believe that Jesus was God's son come to earth. And he wants everyone else to know it too. Remember that at the time John writes this, he's the last of the disciples still living. All the other ones have been killed for their faith. And here's John, exiled on an island, having suffered much for Jesus. And he says, do you want to know what love is? What love looks like? Well, it looks like Jesus. And because God's love comes to us in a person, God's goal for us is to be connected to this person, to be changed by this person. John says, Jesus came so that we might live through him. He's talking about spiritual life here. The book of Ephesians says, we are spiritually dead in our sins, apart from Jesus. We've all rebelled from God. We've all chosen our own way over God's way through what we've done and what we've left undone. So we naturally make life about us. But the life we were created to live is something, it's something much bigger than ourselves. We were made to live life for God. The first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? And what's the answer? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. <laughs> Notice our main purpose is all about God. Yet we don't have to be taught to make life about ourselves instead of him. So John tells us earlier in his book, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. But the problem is even deeper than that, because it's not just that we've done sinful things, but we're born with a sinful disposition toward, with a natural disposition towards sin and away from God. This is why the Bible says we're born enemies of God and deserving of his displeasure. His wrath even, we deserve his wrath. We'll talk more about this in a minute, but for now, this is the reason why we need saving. Our relationship with God is broken, and our only hope for reconciliation, to put it back together, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is through something outside of ourselves. So God could have sent anything to rescue us, but he sent a person. And he could have sent anyone to rescue us, but he sent his son. So God's love is in the person of Jesus. But like we'll see in this next verse, God's love is also through the sacrifice of Jesus. Look at verse, uh, verse 10 again. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
Now, there's a couple of things to notice in this verse. The first is that he starts by saying that being made right with God is not that we loved God. The Bible's clear throughout. The only way to be right with God through our own effort is to be perfect. This is what we were talking about before. If we're honest with ourselves, we know that we fall far short of perfect. And I think God has been using the fact that I'm in a house with five other people and can't leave right now uh, to make me acutely aware of my imperfectness, of my selfishness, my impatience, my quickness to anger, uh, my, my lack of self-control. And while it's disappointing to see this stuff uh, and to see it come out so regularly, it's God's kindness to remind me that I need him as much as anyone, probably even more so. Now, our temptation is to think that since we've wronged God, we can just do some good things to, uh, to, to make up for the bad things that we've done. And maybe if we can just do more good than bad, the scales will sort of tip in our favor and God will accept us. But this is actually what distinguishes Christianity from, from every other religion. Every other religion offers us a way to earn our way to God. If we do a certain amount of the right things in the right way, uh, God or the gods will be, uh, will be appeased. And we will have earned our way uh, to God. But John is saying the gospel of Jesus flips salvation around. He says we're not saved by anything we do but by faith in something that someone has done on our behalf, something we could never accomplish on our own. See, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. The, the wrongs we've committed against God and others uh, deserve punishment, judgment. Now, people tend to bristle when we talk about the judgment of God, but we all understand that judgment is a part of justice, and justice is a good thing. We wouldn't sit through the, tri the trial of Dylan Roof and listen to the details of him walking into Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina during their Bible study and opening fire and killing nine people and think, well, this is bad, but if he says um, sorry, like really nicely, or if he can do some, uh, some really nice things for people to make up for it, then that should be enough and he doesn't need to be punished. No, justice begs for a guilty verdict and a punishment that fits the crime. Well, God is just, so our breaking of his law demands justice. We're guilty of cosmic treason, as R.C. Sproul called it, and the punishment we deserve is the wrath of God. But the hope that we have on Good Friday is is good news. It's this gospel message that even though we can't earn our way to God, even though we have not loved God, what does the rest of verse 10 say? God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This word propitiation is only used a couple of times in the whole Bible. And it's not really a word we use at all in, uh, in conversation, but it means to appease someone's wrath. So if our sins deserve the wrath of God as punishment, there's really only two options uh, for his wrath to be appeased. We can be the object of his wrath and pay for our own sins, or, or someone can stand in our place to take the wrath our sins deserve. So those sins are justly paid for. And this is what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. He is the propitiation for our sins, the appeasement of God's wrath in our place. This is why God's Savior had to be a person. He had to be a flesh and blood person who could suffer and die in our place. But he also had to be God because only a perfect person who didn't deserve the wrath of God for his own sins could stand in the place for those who do. This is what we have in Jesus. And this is why it's such a display of God's love. God becomes both just and the justifier as he pours out his wrath on sin, but pours it out on his son in our place. Jesus came and lived a perfect life in our place, a life we could never live on our own, so that he could be our propitiation, our, our substitute, 
to suffer and to die the death we deserve because of our sins. So God initiates salvation. While we were still God's enemies and far from him, he sent Jesus to be our propitiation, to die in our place. So through faith in him, we could be made right with God. John, in another place, puts it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So because God has done this for you, we all have a question to ask ourselves. What am I depending on to be right with God? Am I depending on myself, my ability to do good and to be good? Or am I depending on Jesus in my place? To put your faith in Jesus is to acknowledge that, that you could never be good enough for God. It's to confess your sins, to acknowledge that your sin has separated you from him, and that sin deserves death. And it's to, it's to cling to Jesus as your only hope, to believe that it's his perfect life in your place, his death on the cross in your place alone that makes you acceptable to God. This is why it, it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. This is why it doesn't matter how good or bad you think you are. Everyone is in desperate need of salvation. And everyone can receive it through faith in Jesus. We can't earn it and we definitely don't deserve it. But Jesus accomplished it for us and offers it to you as a gift. This is grace. This is God's love for you. So what are you depending on today? Maybe today is the day that you turn from your sin to Jesus. Maybe today is the day that you turn from living for yourself to living for God. Maybe today is the day you move from being an enemy of God because of your sin to a dearly loved child of God because of Jesus who died in your place. Now, let's look at verse 11 quickly. Uh, look at it. Uh, look at it again. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God's love transforms us to love like Jesus. It's interesting that John sees the result of believing God's love for us in Jesus is that we are transformed to love like Jesus. If God so loved us, then what? Then we ought to love one another, right? If we've experienced this kind of love uh, from Jesus and through Jesus, then we ought to love one another. It's not an option. This is a test of our faith. This isn't what, uh, what earns our faith, right? But it's what we can look at in our life to say, have we truly experienced this love of Jesus? If we have, uh, then we ought to love one another. It had happened to John. John witnessed the way Jesus loved people around him for three years. Then John experienced God's love for him as he watched Jesus die from the foot of the cross. And from then on, he became the disciple known for love. And it's not just from the example Jesus sets. Something happens when we put our faith in him. We're not just moved from sickness to health. We're moved from death to life. And when we're made spiritually alive in Christ, we're given the ability to live for Christ through loving him and loving those around us. Francis Grimke was a Presbyterian pastor in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was one of the more influential African-American pastors of the late 1800s, early 1900s, including during the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918. Listen to what he said about the pandemic uh, he and his people were facing then. He said, God knows what he's doing. His work is not going to suffer. Out of it, I believe great good is coming. All the churches, as well as the community at large, are going to be the stronger and better for this season of distress through which we have been passing. Even in a time of social distancing, of quarantines, of widespread sickness and even fear, God knows what he's doing. And his work is not going to suffer. 
He's not surprised by this moment, and he continues to work through it. And one of the ways he's working is through you and through me. Through his people who have been transformed so they can love like Jesus. What a moment. What an opportunity to turn this kind of love we've experienced from God into the kind of life God makes possible with him. Sacrificially giving ourselves away to friends and enemies, neighbors and strangers. And not for how it makes us feel or for how it makes us look when we post these things on social media, but simply for the glory of God. The very thing we were created to live for. And not because it will make God love us more, but because he first loved us. As we close, I wonder if you heard this statement from the Surgeon General just a few days ago. He said, this is going to be the hardest and the saddest week of most Americans' lives. This is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment, our 9-11 moment. Only it's not going to be localized. It's going to be happening all over the country. I read this this week and I thought, how providential for us and good of God that this kind of week would fall on Holy Week. That what could feel like the worst week ever for many Americans would happen at the same time we celebrate the worst day in human history. What a hopeful reminder for us that if God could take the worst day in human history and turn it into the best day for us, if God could turn this day into Good Friday, isn't it possible that he could redeem today by using it to stir your affections and transform your life with his love for you through his son, Jesus, who died in your place? Let me pray that this would be the case for you and for me uh, today. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for showing it to us in the person of Jesus, your son, who you sent to live and to die in our place uh, for our sins uh, so that we could be right with you, so that we could no longer be your enemies, but be your children instead. God, what good news this is for us. Uh, help us to believe it today. Uh, help us to recognize how far we fall short and help us to embrace this good news of what you've done for us in Jesus. Uh, give us the courage uh, to put our faith uh, in Jesus. Thank you for loving us enough to send him. Would we be transformed even today by this love uh, that we would even see it evidenced in our life uh, as, we, uh, as we reach out to the people around us, uh, overflowing with the love that we've experienced first from you. Thanks for Jesus who makes all of this possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen.